All right, so I would like everyone to take their seats uh, and welcome you to this next session called Building Your Own Digital Domain. And if I could ask the prior panel to uh, move outside if you'd like to continue the conversation. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is Building Your Own Digital Domain. So I presume that many of you might be interested in starting your own website, starting your own uh, independent media success like the folks we have on our panel here. So uh, I just want to go around and have each person introduce themselves. Uh, these are on the n3con.com website. And I'm going to say if you could introduce yourself, uh, your title, and uh, I'm saying that this is the show off round. So in one minute or two minutes, just tell us how amazing and what the reach is of each of your websites. So I've set it up. It's going to sound like they're boasting. They are but we'll hear it from their own mouths. All right, so Alex, starting with you. Hi, uh, my name's Alexander Hotz. I'm the multimedia director for Coconuts Media. Uh, we have five city websites. We're a network of city websites in Southeast Asia. We're in Bangkok, Manila, Hong Kong, Singapore, and KL. And we're hoping to expand to Jakarta, Yangon, and then into India, hopefully before the end of this year. Uh, as far as uniques, uh, we have about uh, almost two and a half million uniques every month so far. We have a YouTube channel, which uh, I believe has around 2,000 subscribers. It's, it's fairly new, but we have uh, pretty impressive um, uh, views on each video, and several of our videos have actually gone very viral. They've been picked up by uh, you know, media in Southeast Asia and the United States and uh, Europe. Uh, so that's my elevator pitch. Hi, my name is Kenneth Tan. I'm managing editor of Shanghaiist.com. We've been around since 2003, um, uh, 2005, sorry, so which makes us about nine years old now. Um, at Shanghaiist, we have a, a slogan that's China in bite sized portions. We exist to inform and educate people about China, what's happening in China today, what Chinese people are talking about, what they're thinking about, one snapshot at a time. So in terms of reach, I think we've got about a million uniques every month right now. I think that makes us the, the largest uh, English language, independent English language China news website at the moment. Yeah. Oi Wan. Hi, I'm Oi Wan. Uh, I have different identities, and today I'm <laughs> I'm the founding member of Immedia. Uh, my other identity is a uh, Global Voices uh, Northeast Asia editor. So uh, this uh, website is a Chinese website and is a citizen media in Hong Kong. It's found in 2004, so one year older than your site. Uh, it's blocked in China, by the way. And so that uh, might be a good thing in your eyes in terms of. Uh, <laughs> Coolness, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, in a way, because we emphasize ourselves as a kind of activist media. Yeah, uh, but our reach is quite big uh, locally because, like in Alexei, we rent uh, about uh, 500 locally, and then we got like uh, 110k uh, likes in Facebook. So we had a little bit of influence in Hong Kong. Uh, the last section is about PR. I think our site is a kind of PR disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Tom Grundy. Um, I, I uh, founded Hong Rong, a local blog. I think I made a mistake with the name, but uh, uh, there is one employee. It's me, and the paying conditions are terrible. I, it's not monetized. <laughs> um, it's, it's two years old. It has around 300,000 unique visitors month, which isn't too bad for Hong Kong. It's often the first to break uh, stories, not often, occasionally, uh, in English. Um, caused a minor international fallout this week with this, the next story down, which is about uh, some textbook. Be the one after that. Um, the, I've got the first investigative piece I've done uh, next week, and uh, I guess it's Shamelessly advocacy journalism, most of it. About a third of it is original content. Um, but I just do it in my spare time for fun. Uh, although my original background is in journalism, and I'll be going back to that, I think, partially on the back of this soon. Um, but there is, it's taken 
year or so to get it stabilized, a lot of server meltdowns and issues, so I can talk about how not to do this as well. All right, thank you. Uh, so clearly each of you are key leaders and or founders of each of your websites. Uh, I want to ask, how did you guys uh, come up with the idea to start this website, or if you did not personally start it, why was it started to begin with? What need was there? And I'm asking this because a follow-up question will be, you know, what needs still exist out there for potential people who want to do uh, this kind, a kind of website? So let's just go around again. So Alex, yourself. Sure. So I, I didn't start the website. It was started by Byron Perry, in our founder, in 2011. And he had been working in Southeast Asia for a few years as a journalist, and he found that there wasn't a go-to English language resource, sort of like a hyper-local uh, blog, the, the sort of blogs that he had read when he was growing up in San Francisco. And that's why he created it, essentially, to fill this, this gap in the market. Um, Shortwrites was started in 2005. Um, uh, at that time, uh, oh, we started it as an alternative to the English language magazines that were that were available in Shanghai. At that time, uh, these magazines were often very poorly written, poorly edited, full of Chinglish, um, and we thought we could offer um, an alternative to that. So we got together a motley crew of people uh, who just wanted to share what they knew about the city. You know, so it. You know, we didn't come together thinking we would um, uh, change the world. We didn't come together thinking we would make a lot of money. But we just came together thinking, you know, hey, we just want to share what we know about Shanghai. At, at that, that time, it. what were the competitors uh, to Shanghaiist? Um, at that time, you mean online? Uh, online or whatever you saw as a competitor, because I would think maybe the equivalent to that's Beijing or that's Shanghai at the time or, you know. Yeah. Like and then uh, there, there, there was a lifestyle website in Shanghai called Smart Shanghai, but that's mostly like lifestyle listings and all of that. So I think uh, we're a very unique animal in, in Shanghai in that we focus a lot on news. We're very news driven. Mm -hmm. yeah. With a very unique voice, of course, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. slightly uh, tongue in cheek in, in many ways. And very, very edgy, I think, yeah. Um, uh, our website is more like a respo response to the political situation in, in Hong Kong at that time. Because in 2003, there were like uh, half, a million, uh, half a million people rallying in the streets uh, against the legislation of Article 23, which is a kind of national security law in Hong Kong. So after that rally, uh, there's a lot of political pressure for the local press. Like a newspaper, for newspaper, they uh, sack uh, a number of writers. Uh, who had uh, regular columns. So t they, they were kicked out from the newspaper and then uh, there were also talk show, radio talk show uh, hosts who were sacked by the commercial radio. So there were, was a very strong need for alternative media. So at that time there were a number of in initiatives and e-media is one of them. Yeah. All right, and uh, uh, you said uh, your website is an activist uh, kind of website. Do you see that there are other competitors, or do you see that everyone is moving towards a similar cause? Because when I think of activism, I think of you know uh, anti-government or pro-democracy kinds of things here. Yeah, uh, we were trying to explore a way of uh, doing, uh, because y you know that in Hong Kong, the formal democracy is not working. I mean, we do, up till now, we do not have universal suffrage, and we don't know whether in the future we will have genuine universal suffrage or not. So we are trying to explore another way of democracy, grassroots democracy through uh, citizen journalism. So uh, uh, I think uh, we are the only site devoted to this uh, mission. Yeah, most of other activist sites or political uh, websites, they are about, they are kind of affiliated with political parties or some sort of political groups. But our site is more independent. We report a lot about uh, the Hong Kong society and also social movement, civil society uh, discussion. But we are not affiliating with any political groups. And yeah, we just encourage uh, people to report about their society and the issues that they're concerned about. Would you ever consider doing something in English language? We tried, but uh, we tried before. We actually put up a website called Interlocals 
after 2005, the, uh, 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 the anti-WTO ministerial meeting. But uh, it takes a lot of resources. Yeah, so we have to close it down like after five years because we do not have enough resources to support the English editing and translation. Yeah. And Tom, what kind of need did you see? Uh, well, I, I came over in 2005 and I think when we probably first met um, and I've been an activist in Hong Kong since then and I have strong feelings about press freedom here and I think unfortunately the, the blog has grown to fill a bit of a gap it, with, within that so it's been a platform for my own politics for many things but it was it was just a couple of years ago that I noticed some of the content that I enjoy and things that are happening and I was uncovering in Hong Kong it was getting upvoted a lot on places like Reddit um, so I, I formed this blog a couple of years ago it was mostly a lonely echo chamber of my own ramblings and some things I imported from my original old travel blog but uh, um, I did a few satirical pieces about the, the giant duck in the harbor getting cancer or something and from then, the traffic has slowly, organically, you know, um, kind of grown from there. Right. Uh, starting up a website or starting up a business, you know, it's not always uh, perfect at every single step. You alluded to that on how not to make a website. So maybe I'll throw it right back at you, and maybe we'll go around this way and say, you know, what was the biggest challenge or the biggest failure, the biggest, like, oh, crap moment I messed up here? I'm not a coder, and I never particularly read up on how to do this or how to... Um, expand it to, to a level where it could be self-sustaining if I wanted it to be. So there's been server meltdowns, rebuilding it from scratch, and I'm very recently understanding search engine optimization and social media and, and stuff like that. Now, but, sorry, uh, when you say server meltdown, did you just choose a bad server yeah. that was really cheap or something? Yes. Or, uh, <laughs> so was where, where was that? Of them was that here in mainland China no, or no, something? it's or? a tiny one back home, which I was running my own. Li I've got a little travel blog. I've and got home is where for, for people? Sort of Home is where, just so. so In England. Okay. Um, and thankfully, with some help of some local friends who know what they're doing, I've now got an expandable one so that when traffic does go a bit crazy and you get a spike, because I think we all know that you know it just does this a lot of the time, the traffic, uh, I, I can increase the capacity to cope with it now, at least. So, so I'm still learning about things each day about that. Right. If someone were to choose a place to do. Uh, to, to have a server that might not melt down, where would you say? I understand Amazon is quite good. I'm, as I say, I'm not a big tech geek with that. I use DigitalOcean, um, where you can rent droplets, which can be expanded depending on the amount of bandwidth traffic you've got. But um, it's, it's controlled with a command prompt with just code, and I'm a little bit locked out of that system. So I, 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 I have a friend who helps with that, thankfully. Right, so a server crashes for you. And Oiwan, how about uh, for your website? Uh, because we have long history, so we had encountered a lot of problems. So like uh, the program pro problem, we start at 2004. At that time, we are not very familiar with the program. So we use a, a open source called OpenACS, and now it no, no longer exists. So I remember in 2006, we have to uh, uh, change all our content into PHP and then uh, 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 use another uh, open source called Drippo. So this is one of the crises. And another crisis is uh, relate also with related with technical things, like our server also cracked down because of hacking. And then uh, we have to move. And then later, we have to use Cloudflare and also Google uh, page speed to, to protect our site from attack. And then, so aside from the technical, uh, the, the political situation in Hong Kong is also getting worse. Uh, two years ago, our office was attacked. I mean, several mobs go to our office. You mean and phys physically, physically attacked? Physically, yeah, physically, with uh, two of our staff there. So, yeah, they were arrested, and then they were, uh, I, I, I think two, two of them were imprisoned. Yeah, but uh, it's related with, with what we have written. Uh, and then another, uh, I mean, more day-to-day -day difficulties is about volunteer because you know Hong Kong is a very uh, busy city. Like, it's very difficult to get devoted volunteers to. Uh, we run by our volunteers, so it's very difficult to get devoted vo volunteers to uh, help us uh, on the content and then help uh, maintaining the site. Uh, so far, we had about twenty, yeah, de devoted volunteer. So opening a website here that 
is an activist website on the doorstep of mainland China with these press censorship issues. Uh, getting hacked, this is something, that, does it still continue? Very, very common. Like, <laughs> uh, uh, we have the June 4th uh, just now. Right, the, just a few the, days ago. The main site of the June 4th, the organization that hosts the June 4th, they had their site closed down for a, a week because of hacking. Yeah, so it's a regular thing. All right, and then, uh, Ken, uh, with Shanghaiist, uh, with the mainland China focus, uh, have you guys ever been hacked before? We haven't. I don't think so. Yeah. You don't think so? <laughs> no. Okay, well, I guess that's we're, a good thing. We're actually then. running on Amazon Web Services, so that's pretty uh, uh, steady, yeah, okay. robust. All right, what's been the biggest uh, issue in the past uh, several years? The, the, the biggest challenge for Shanghaiist has always been, you know, the search for profitability and sustainability, right? We, we, we're an English language website running in China, so it's actually very difficult to, to attract um, advertisers. Um, the fact is, um, advertisers are still a lot more willing to place money on print than online. Mm. That is a sad fact, that is a reality. So um, it's something that we are still working on. I think we've made a lot of um, 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 uh, improvements over the last year. I think we're just, just about close to breaking even. After several years, finally. After nine years. After nine years. How do you eat? Yeah. Lots of ramen. Well, you know what? We don't even have an office right now. My guys work out of my living room. Yeah, and thankfully, I don't have any mobs, uh, 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 you know. But I'll tell you this. I've, I've, you know, um, uh, that was a year ago, two years ago, um, when I was live blogging the anti-Japanese protests in Shanghai. I had people um, putting up my photos on Sina Weibo, calling on the Shanghai police to arrest me and stuff like that. So, so that was pretty intense, yeah. But they did not arrest you? No, no, thankfully not. Did you have people trailing you? I mean, this is this is a personal. This is an issue for for both of you in this in this line of work. Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. And Alex, for yourself, what has been the biggest issue? Uh, while uh, Shanghai has been around for nine years, you guys have been around for two. Maybe yeah. for those, this might be quite relevant. Who want to start up something in the near future? You can speak to the early birthing pains, so to speak. Uh, yeah. I mean, starting a company. There are so many issues, so many like from personnel to uh, I, I have a traditional sort of journalistic background, um, reading a balance sheet, stuff as basic as that. Like I don't really have a, a financial accounting education. So that, that was something that I had to sort of teach myself. Um, but I would say sort of what you echoing, what Kenneth, what you were saying is um, you know, finding a way to make this company sustainable. And I think something that's unique about coconuts and something that a lot of people are very interested in us is because we're trying to adapt um, a lot of sort of the most innovative uh, monetization strategies that are being in used in the US right now in Asia. So that means like sponsored content. Um, and companies that really influence us and we think of as sort of like the internet companies that are defining modern journalism are like Gawker and Vice. And I think that they are, they have found a way to, you know, really build successful online brands. And they've done it not necessarily through the traditional route of advertising, which I think anybody who knows anything about online advertising and trying to support a business with online advertising is is very, very difficult, if, if not impossible. Um, and I think that, you know, the traditional news organizations, they have the luxury of s subscribers. And they haven't, you know, the luxury of an, an established voice, a trusted uh, identity. And we don't have that. So for us, it's, you know, finding very creative ways to to make this work. And I'm curious to hear from you, like, have you thought about, like, uh, sponsored content? Have you thought about another, you know, uh, non-traditional ways of events? I know that Mashable is big on, you know, holding events to try and, uh, you know, essentially raise cash. Yeah, we actually do quite a bit of sponsored content as on well, Shanghai yeah. as well. Yeah, so it's um, primarily banner ads, sponsored content, and, um, Sometimes even social media as well. Yeah. Um, a lot of advertisers are very interested in our social media reach. At the moment, we have about 81,000 fans on Facebook 
another 36,000 on Twitter. So um, a lot of advertisers are interested in, in, in somehow being able to have their brand visible through our social media channels. And I guess certain advertisers will be more up to advertising on uh, less controversial websites, I suppose. Maybe something more travel related than something more activist related, right? How do you guys get around that or who can you attract? I'm sure there are people who do want to advertise, but you know, what kinds of advertisers are you able to get? So for, for us, we've, you know, we've, because we're so young, we've just started to experiment with this. And so far, some of the, the clients that we've gotten uh, include Hendrix Gin, uh, Vespa, uh, Ness Dolce Gusto, uh, Ness, Ness Cafe. Um, and I think our primary sort of the brands that want to, you know, produce sponsored content on coconuts are those that want to really uh, sort of reach a younger, uh, educated, uh, urbane, wealthy uh, customer. Well, that's alcohol, automobiles, and caffeine. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I come from a super traditional, like, church and state. This is journalism, and all the advertisers are on that side, sort of background. And so it was really kind of uncomfortable for me that when I first started, you know, thinking about how do we attract advertisers and how do we like get companies interested in us. But um, that really is the future, I think, for a lot of, if you want to have a job in media, realistically, this is something that you should be thinking about. And I, I, I think that a lot of us who have that traditional background feel very uncomfortable, um, you know, you know, thinking about thinking in like a, a dark side mind, mindset, for lack of a, a better expression. But it is really important if you want to run a successful business nowadays. And uh, very quickly, if we can go down the line, what kinds of advertisers are, are on all your white guys' websites? Um, it at Shanghai is, it's basically um, any company that wants to reach out to expats in China. So it could be um, uh, travel agents, air tickets, insurance companies, um, um, local bars and restaurants in Shanghai. That's about, that's the various market segments we have. We only have one ad banner and then most of uh, our advertisements are from university and NGO. Uh, our revenue is not depending on advertisement, it's donation. Uh, we have individuals, uh, small uh, donations, and then we depend a lot on goodwill, like uh, our office is uh, uh, supported by a foundation. Yeah, so, yeah, our cash, our annual cash flow is about uh, 700,000 Hong Kong. Yeah, so, so less than yeah, most of the US. work are really volunteer based. Yeah. And all of you have a full-time job on top of this? Yeah, uh, we have three full-time staff, but they are not responsible for the content. They are responsible for community building, administrative work, office management, yeah, etc. Uh, but for the content part, it's uh, mainly volunteer work. Yeah. Yeah, I have a full-time job, so I haven't had to worry about it and have just concentrated on the content and look more recently at other people's rate cards as to what, what it could become potentially. Um, but I just have Google Ads, which just about pay for the hosting, and and, uh, uh, and that's about it. Um, there's been a, f a few events I've used it to to launch certain political things. We worked together uh, with the uh, support Edward Snowden rally. We had a thousand people go to the U.S. consulate, but that's probably not what you're thinking about with events. I have the pillow fight uh, in Central every year, organized through the blog, and that is something which I've been approached for with spon uh, by sponsors, and I get emails every day um, inquiring about advertising, but... About more pillow fights. Ab about just advertising on the yeah. blog. Oh, every three week. or four spaces, <laughs> you know, four ads. But uh, I, I've not reacted to them particularly right. yet. And but you're not making money yet. No. Do you um, think you will? But I, I think I could flick a switch and register a company. Yeah. My permanent residency, you know, I need to apply for, and perhaps I could, I could look into that. But um, I don't know. I think I've I've been a bit purist and reluctant, um, as you say. You know, coming from more traditional perspectives. But I also recognise that you kind of have to have all these strings to your bow. And so, 
I've tried to concentrate on the skills of being able to photograph things, video things, write, write things up, present it online in a concise way. And now I'm learning a bit more about search engine optimization, social media, and perhaps monetization. So, uh, but if, if I get serious about that, I think it's going to have to fork off to something new and separate um, for Hong Kong. Um, I, as I say, I think there's a deficit and a need for you know, English news here. And if only because you can't have, you know, you can't be taken seriously by people who don't know the blog or by advertisers if it's called Hong Wrong. That was probably my biggest mistake with the blog. Actually. Maybe you're a 2 point might be Hong right. <laughs> yeah, two wrongs, I don't know. But, uh, one unique feature it has got recently um, is that uh, it's the it's the first um, media outlet in Hong Kong and maybe beyond to have a secure platform which uh, Snowden and his, his uh, journalist friends use to communicate so people can actually leak things to the blog, so that's one thing. But uh, as, as for making it sustainable, um, not quite there yet. All right. So. Uh, Raising money, still trying to raise money, not really raising money, too new to make money, and just barely broken in nine years. So I guess not a really good uh, track record if you want to make money, I guess. Uh, raising money is one issue. Raising interest, of course, is you know why you guys are also want to do this. So this kind of resonance, I want to talk about this, resonance with uh, your viewers, with your readers. Um, love to hear what you think you guys have done in the whole entire history of each of your websites. Uh, that has resonated so well with your audiences, and uh, maybe we could even bring it up if we can, if Joyce can help find it, if you give her um, a way to, to do. So, Alex, for you guys, for coconuts, what has resonated so amazingly well that you said, "Oh my God, never realized that would be terrific," but we got X thousand, X million clicks on it, and, and um, why did it resonate? Also, sure, sure. So, there's there's a bunch of things. I think that perhaps. Well, my, my job is specifically Coconuts TV, so I help manage our YouTube property, which makes uh, you know, uh, short news videos, essentially. Um, and one, our most popular video um, was, if you just go to YouTube, yes, right there. Bangkok's Mexican Gangsters, that's our big... I like LB songs. That is I like one of the videos that. that went viral. Can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah, it's right there. Why don't we why don't we play like um, a minute of it? Sure. All the homies, they know what I mean. Baby, let me show you how I lean. Like a so this is all produced by you guys. Oh yeah. When we do a dance, we do it like what? Like a cholo. Side to side, elbows up, side to side, elbows up. Like a cholo, all up in the club, ten deep, looking for some highness. We on the creep. I need a bad one, a real freak. Find them on the dance floor, so don't sleep. I'm Mr. Dixie, I'm from the office. I'm a Mexican gangster. I'm a gangster. Hello, my name is Yaki Fatay. I'm from the police. I'm a gangster. I'm a gangster. You know? Hello, my name is Yaki Fatay. I'm a gangster. I'm a gangster. I'm a gangster. I'm a gangster. You know? Hello, my name is Yaki Fatay. Okay. <laughs> we can pause it there. I love it. I love it that he, uh, you know, gave the sign of respect before <laughs> becoming a Mexican gangster. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So how many views? All right. So we're seeing 275,000 views here. Yeah. This is reflective just on YouTube, of course. This is just on YouTube. We don't have uh, a lot of news organizations like the Journal. They have their sort of independent players. So I don't believe you guys are on. YouTube, which uh, we we send it out to you YouTube send it out as well. to YouTube. Yeah. Okay. So I, yeah, I, we we don't have our independent player. Everything is on here, but unfortunately, I it like doesn't sort of really reflect the the true number of views this has gotten because this was picked up in a lot of other by a lot of other in, uh, independent media outlets, uh, Fusion in the states, Gawker. Um, it was picked up. Uh, KCRW is a big. Um, uh, NPR station, the LA-based NPR station in uh, the United States. So it got a ton of attention because it's this weird, quirky, uh, interesting story that had not really been done in a cool way in traditional media. And that's, for us, that's a lot of our bread and butter. It's um, sort of this tongue-in-cheek, uh, very similar to what Shanghaiist is doing, is this different voice um, that is you know, hopefully we like to think of ourselves as funny, offbeat, um, and 
you know, cool, hopefully. Anyway, um, this, this really got, you know, went super viral. There was, uh, we got a lot of press for it, and I think it really is, it, it helps define our style, I guess, it showcases our style better, better said. So having a new, uh, a different style, setting yourself apart from everyone else is key to yeah. someone who wanted to do their own Absolutely. Uh, I think that having an authentic voice is something that is uh, refreshing. And I think that, you know, it's, it would be, in my mind, impossible to be, to be successful if you were to set up, um, you know, the next, uh, like a new Wall Street Journal. Like, there's already a Wall Street Journal. There's already the traditional uh, voice of God journalism out there, you know, uh, and it's out there in a bunch of different outlets. So really the only way to be successful is by finding a new niche, a new voice, an authentic voice that someone hasn't, you know, tapped yet. And um, I think Shanghaiist has been successful because of that. You know, Hong Rong has been successful because of that. You guys are filling a niche for what you, you were doing. I think that our success comes from that as well. Right. And uh, to Ken, what has been one of your most successful uh, articles, videos, whatever? You know, I, I think at Shanghai, one of the things we do well is um, um, our team, our editorial team, um, they're always on, they're always scouring Chinese social media sites for, uh, for new stories. Um, and we're, we do a very good job of translating stuff as, as it happens from, from Chinese into English. So one good example was um, the Sichuan earthquake in 2008. Uh, we were, you know, we were aggregating news very quickly from Chinese news sources and translating them bit by bit into English, um, and that that story went viral. Joyce is bringing up a few things here. Do uh, or do any of these um, come to mind? On which one, actually, was? I think it's way too far down. Oh, much farther yeah. down. Okay, but uh, the such one earth earthquake. Yeah, and then there was another example: um, the the CCTV tower in Beijing that that caught on fire. And we were basically the first to break the story in English. Um, and that story went viral as well. Yeah. And how many people do you have on, on staff or just working? Generally? At the moment, we have about six full-timers, so it's a very lean team. So a and lot they of all work out of my living room. So, yeah. <laughs> I've been to your living yeah. room. It's not that big. Yeah, it's tiny. <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, why did those, those resonate? I mean, here we're talking about crises, mm -hmm. earthquakes, mm -hmm. fires. Mm -hmm. Is that what resonates in China then? <sighs> well, yeah. Bad news. It, it, I I wouldn't say it it resonates, but you know if if, if it's uh, bleeds, if it leads. It's it's mm -hmm. it's a piece of breaking news, right? So so it, it tends to get shared. Okay. Yeah. And Oiwan, what's been the most successful uh, post? We, we have two kinds of audience. One kind is uh, they, they they just uh, read the news and for entertaining. Yeah. So interesting stories like. Uh, who broke up with who? The, I mean, all this. Uh, that doesn't sound very activist, though. That sounds no, but but because <laughs> we allow people to post article, so we still have that kind of news uh, or, or story in our site. But then our target or our edge is on the exclus uh, exclusive uh, activist news. So like uh, during the uh, anti uh, rapid train uh, uh, campaign in Hong Kong, uh, because. Our information source are directly from the campaign, so we, we got a lot of information coming out. Uh, in Hong Kong, the government and the PR sector is very good at media massaging. So like at first, the uh, anti-rapid uh, uh, or the, the construction of the rapid railway is not an issue in Hong Kong. Like 80% of people support the project. Uh, for those who don't know about the rapid railway, can you just go through that? Just uh, very it's quick? a train from Canton to Hong Kong, and then it's very expensive. It, uh, it's like billions of dollars and then now it's out bad and then the construction is destroying our own uh, our, uh, how you call that the, the arch arch uh, ecology? not ecology we because uh, Hong Kong had a very long history uh, back from Song Dynasty so it's destroying our history so yeah heritage so uh, so at that time we are the uh, major source for this kind of uh, information that is not from government channel and then stories like uh, the ocean park like they the pr they want us to, they, they want the newspaper to write about uh, the, the new birth of their animal but then we 
write about the death of the animal. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, these are all exclusive. That's why I say we are kind of nightmare for <laughs> PR. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so giving a different voice to what's actually happening there. All right, and what's been the, the, the greatest performing uh, article on Hong Rong? Oh, in terms of traffic, it was things like the, the, the slapping video of, of someone in Tukwa Wan, just because I've got to it first in English, or, or this week with the, the textbook thing. But one of the more fun ones, uh, being a nightmare, which I enjoy as well, was if you click on the mega index, if you go up, where's the menu gone? Oh, there we go. Uh, so this new theme, which is just a month old, you scroll down to the substandard, it, it resizes to whatever screen. It's my ve very inefficient way of listing. This is really long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keep going. Oh, up, and um, something, something versus the standard, where I had a bit of a fight with local free newspaper. Um, the second one up. Battle of the, the logos. logos, down at the bottom. And then so this yeah, is the satirical the part one. of the site, but, but the standard uh, took objection to it. If you scroll down, they asked me to stop using the logo, so I very <laughs> kindly um, came up with some alternatives, which if you scroll down, um, I asked them to choose one. <laughs> um, a number of different photo. <laughs> Who different is, it? is that you? Prototypes. The stand. Because <laughs> yeah. they're dreadful. But <laughs> the, the South China Morning Post isn't particularly much better on many things. So I've been trying to fill a gap with some more s serious news. But this stuff obviously does a bit better. But my my aim is to. Oh yeah. At the time there was a <laughs> big inflatable <laughs> pile of shit. <laughs> And this leads into a video I think Oiwan posted up and a more serious point, <laughs> uh, God save the Queen, um, uh -uh. about copyright and parody in Hong Kong. So I'm always trying to insert a little bit of broccoli or whatever into some of the nonsense I put up there. And I think about a tenth of it is more serious stuff, which mostly I've written. And um, about a third of it is original content, which I've made. So just things that interest me when I've gone off hiking some abandoned village or whatever. So it's very visual, it's very concise, I think is part of its success you're asking about. Um, I'll, I'm, I don't afraid, I'm not afraid to use external links to explain things uh, rather than going into detail there. Um, and I'll give full lowdowns for English speakers who perhaps find it hard to keep up. So if there's something like the scholarism um, protest going down, WTO or, or the Grand Joe Rail Links, I'm probably there anyway you know, as an advocate, as a journalist, or as an activist, and so I can quite quickly relate it back concisely in one page. You know, when when I get back to, to my flat, and it's quite fast. Like I say, it was the, the the first on say the big Bitcoin mine that was discovered in Hong Kong, the Erewhona uh, torture case, uh, the domestic worker. So it was the first in English to to get those stories up, and some of it is automated with the tweeting, and I can time the posts happen if I'm not around. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, it's, it's uh, very much ad advocacy journalism too. So. Okay, great. Uh, we're running uh, out of time. We have maybe about 10 minutes or so. So let's stop our conversation. And I want to open it up to Q&A for uh, our audience members. Uh, for those, maybe you want to build your own website. So show of hands, who'd like to ask? Uh, OK, several people. Um, I think I saw you first, then you second, Joanna third. And then fourth, yeah. and then fifth, yeah, sixth. All right. Uh, hi guys, um, thanks for um, keeping us informed here on what you guys are doing. Um, Kenneth, this question is for you mainly. I think. Could you um, identify yourself? Also? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Stephen Roberts. Uh, we um, we have a um, independent English uh, magazine and our website, and um, even a small TV show now in, in Dongguan, China. Um, and uh, we we are now with the Ziv um, is the publisher. He's been very successful with his print magazine uh, for about eight years now. Uh, we've we've updated our website and, and um, got a lot more full there. And what we're doing is we're putting a lot of our, our monthly um, content on that, and we're wanting to um, we want something you know more substantial than that. Um, and we, we watch a lot of what, of what you're doing, and uh, you know we're now in the process of training and finding freelance um, uh, local journalists that, that can translate and do that kind of news. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious some of the stuff that you guys do um, post. Um, Seems to be a little bit controversial, and which would, for uh, for someone with our stature, would be a little probably dangerous, uh, especially considering we have a print magazine. And um, so, could you speak on that? How how do you judge that? And and um, 
make those choices. Yeah, we, yeah, it's always a tough call. You know, um, Shanghai was one of the first English language chi China blogs to, to come online. And so over the years, I think we've always been there and trying to push the boundaries of, 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 um, of, uh, of, 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 of news, you know, before before we came along, um, the, 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 there was so much stuff that people were just not willing to go into, you know. Um, but we we you know we've we've been we've been um, you know we've done stories on Tibet, on Xinjiang, on Tiananmen, on Taiwan, on Hong Kong, on on on, on just about every topic imaginable, and um, thankfully I've not I'm I'm still here talking to you today, so yeah. And it's not blocked, so. And it's it's never been blocked. And it's never been blocked. Yeah. I think part of what it is is you know in 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 the large scheme of things we're still we're still a very small website, um, and also because we're we're in English, so it kind of helps us to stay under the radar. It perhaps protects yourself. Um, was your That is something I'm constantly worried about as our team grows. Um, so one possibility is uh, we may have our news team working from somewhere outside of mainland China. That's one possibility. Yeah, we're still weighing the possibilities. Thank you. Um, my name is Clemens Helbuck. I'm from Shanghai.com, uh, which is a large uh, German community media in China. And I have a question um, for the Coconuts uh, uh, website uh, regarding your domain. It's uh, coconuts.co uh, and not .com. And uh, probably coconuts.com was already registered. And .co yes. is actually the, it's the, the, the country level domain for Colombia. And I was wondering, um, does this choice of, uh, of this uh, CO domain uh, in any way affect the, the growth of your business? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think it has. Um, I think a lot of, you know, dot com is kind of like the prime real estate, but, you know, like all prime real estate, it's taken up at some point, right? So, you know, now a lot of startups, Bitly, right, uses dot ly, which is the Libyan country code, right? And I think now actually the, the organization, I'm forgetting the name, that sort of regulates this has, ICANN has, has said that, you know, it doesn't have to be you know, specifically country specific. Um, and I think that, you know, internet con consumers are getting smarter and they're understanding this and, you know, most people will Google us, frankly, you know, a lot of our traffic comes from Google searches. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's prevented some traffic, but what can you do, right? Thinking that they might be a Colombian drug cartel or something, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, all right, uh, Joanna. Hi, I'm Joanna. I'm um, a journalist based in Hong Kong. And um, Oi Wan addresses in your introduction, you said um, in media reacted to the sacking of prominent columnists and um, declining freedoms in Hong Kong. I'm just wondering what other panelists think. Um, we see these indexes saying press freedom is in trouble in Hong Kong and reports that foreign media covering China are under increasing pressure. Um, as people who are um, leaders in independent media, do you feel like you have any responsibility to contribute to a free and vibrant press? And have you personally seen any conflicts arise with your reporting and um, kind of dilemmas you've had? And that's for, that's for everyone. Oh, for everyone. So do you feel the need to contribute to a fair and, and public press? That's the question. We had uh, three full-time staff members. One of our staff members is devoted to advocacy work, policy advocacy. Yeah. And then we, we studied, we researched on the policy, uh, especially uh, related with uh, the media and then the, the governance of internet. And then we wrote back a policy paper, we launched a public camp campaign so that uh, the, uh, Hong Kong will be, remain free in our uh, internet. Um, I think at Chiang Highest, um, yeah, we we try to plug in the gaps um, where you know because basically there's there's only um, 
There were publications like China Daily, Shanghai Daily, which are all government owned. And then you've got the um, uh, local expat magazines like that, Shanghai, City Weekend, and all of that. Um, they were not able to cover the sort of news that we're able to do. So there definitely is a responsibility to, to plug in the gaps, and that's what we try to do. I could say that for coconuts, we're in a pretty unique position being based in uh, just all across the region. Um, and be, be having this unique situation where we're in Manila, Hong Kong, KL, uh, Bangkok, you know, we're, we, we're forced to learn the regional politics and what we can and cannot do. And in Thailand, for example, there are, if you guys know anything about Thai politics, there are certain things you simply cannot talk about and still have a business. So we are very wary of that. And if a commenter says something uh, that, you know, in the US, in Hong Kong even, wouldn't be a big deal, we have to, you know, expunge that comment lest the... For example, talking about the health of the king. That's one of them. Yes, yes. You, I said that. You didn't say that. I Don't didn't worry. say that. <laughs> he's, he's Elvis to us. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, we're pretty, I'd, I'd say Hong Kong is pretty free. Um, compared to Manila, we're, we're careful. KL, we're, uh, there's certain things we can't say. Um, as we open up in Jakarta, there's certain things we have to be worried about. Um, I think that... We are not an advocacy site, and we are not trying to change the politics of the places that we're opening up. We're trying to run a publication. If we do run news, um, if you go to our Thailand site, for example, our Bangkok site, uh, we have we use the AFP, so we'll say sort of AFP colon uh, military coup or junta takes control of Thailand. You know, uh, we don't attribute this to us because especially in a place like Thailand, the politics are so vicious, and if you do anything that can be remotely construed as favoring one side, you can fall into a trap where you can piss off the wrong person, and those can have really real consequences for not just us, but you know we have a lot of Thai employees, so we're you know, really mindful of just you know, our safety. Do you have a special deal with AFP, or is this just a choice? No, we, we we're uh, just pulled it off and put it on. We have a no, no we have a deal with yeah, we have a subscription. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're all aware that press freedom in Hong Kong has, has taken a bit of a nosedive uh, uh, with the Reporters Without Borders reports and CPJ, etc. Freedom House, its ratings uh, going down, and because of the you know political or commercial interests, you're just left with. Apple Daily, arguably, and you guys and a couple of others. But in, in English, it's arguably even worse because already South China kind of have a monopoly and things are kind of rapidly declining there as well. So um, I, 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 it, I don't like to fulfill that gap or that need, but sometimes um, I, I found that I, that I have on explaining, you know, Occupy Central and dealing with it fair, fairly, for example, um, or or reporting in a timely way the, the, the attack on some artists during Art Week a few weeks ago. Um, and I agree there's some more protection you get in English as well. Um, and there's no top-down censorship in Hong Kong, so this is kind of underutilized, and I'm hoping to try and fill that gap in the future even more, hopefully. But uh, one of the first questions was about security, and I remember that actually my, my sites are under constant attack, but I, I understand it may be automated bots and, and not actually a human malicious attack, so I don't know. But uh, but yeah, it's a shame that in English, bloggers such as myself and moreover um, Hemlock, the big Lai Chi blog, uh, are doing what the mainstream media should be doing. I think I promised uh, one, maybe two more questions that I had already pointed out. So that was one and two, yes. And then just ask your question very quickly in the interest of time, because I know we're going to, going into our break right now. Uh, in, to the back first. Uh, yeah, to the back first. Just very quickly. My name is Daniel. I am a freelance journalist from Rwanda. 
Uh, my question is, you say that uh, in order to start a website, you need to identify a, a need for, for an audience. And uh, I have a project to start a, a, a website back home that will be reporting on a business issue in Rwanda. That one, that need is, I have already identified it. And on the other hand, you say that it took you nine years to, to break even for your website. So I got scared. So my question is, how do you go from starting a website and all the way to monetizing so that it can be su sustainable? That is my question. It's a very easy question, I think. Uh, can you summarize that? I don't, have, I don't have the perfect answer for you. You would have to discover your own path. Um, what I would say is, um, if, you look at, if, if you look around you at the, at the publishing world, um, the Guardian is losing millions of dollars every year. The New York Times is losing millions of dollars every year. So, you know, taking that into account, I don't feel that bad that, you know, You're I'm not profitable You're doing pretty good yet. considering then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to, to give a more practical answer, perhaps, I, I think building it and they will come has kind of worked a little bit for me. But I use WordPress. I use AdRotate for ad banners and, and Google ads, and a lot of the traffic comes from Facebook, and I've, I've just done trial and error experimentation, and um, but, um, recently I just put a few hundred dollars down on, on boosting and paying for sponsored uh, advertisements on Facebook, and those kind of work well. And I understand if you want to start quickly with a bang, then putting a lot of money into that can, can help increase your presence quite quickly, but also search engine optimization so that your site comes up in, in Google when certain search terms are used. Um, that, that's been helpful a lot as well, and that's been quite important. So start cheap and start small and then see how it goes from there. And then last question, Sophie. Yeah, um, my name's Sophie. I'm a digital journalist with CNN. Um, Tom, you were saying that at the beginning it was a bit like publishing into an echo chamber. So I was just wondering for all of you that were there at the beginning and you had sort of no readership, how did you find the, the motivation to keep doing it when, when there weren't many readers? Um, I guess because I, I enjoyed it anyway and I was, it, I was just doing it incidentally, you know, at home and, and uh, on, during lunch and stuff. So um, th there wasn't any pressure. and. I was just doing what I enjoyed, so it's as simple as that for me. And the politics. Yeah, for us, uh, it's similar because uh, those who are writing for our site, they are volunteers, so they do not have to face the, the pressure. Even though some of them, they are professional journalists, yeah, they don't have to face the, the, the pressure from government or, or their, their boss. Uh, we started the website before this whole Facebook revolution came along. So uh, in those days, people would actually um, check out the website by actually going to, to their browser and typing shanghaist.com. These days, our homepage only takes about 15% of our total page views. Um, um, most, most people are coming from social media avenues, going directly to stories, to, to story pages. So um, social media has been a, a very big boom to us. Um, well, I wasn't, Byron, the guy who founded our site, started it pretty much in his, his bedroom, uh, blogging on his laptop. So I wasn't there in the, the early days. I joined about a year after. And Coconuts was still pretty small. We saw real our explosive growth. Um, you know, I'd say a few months after I joined. And I think that having been, I worked in traditional media for several years. And, you know, I loved loved it. But, um, you know, it's, as I'm sure you guys know, is incredibly unstable. And uh, there's a lot of issues with, let's say it, it's hard to be creative. Um, and I think that one of the real joys of a startup is even if you, you know, it's, it's you know, if, even if it's hard to ramp up, even if, you know, with all the financial pressures, uh, there's a real sense of accomplishment with when it does pay off, having created something yourself um, is, uh, is very satisfying.
Right. So we're looking at uh, personal motivations, you know, activism, a little bit of fun, little, filling a niche, being creative as well, all the things needed uh, in terms of starting up your own independent media success. I think uh, we all want to wish you guys well in each of yours. And um, I would also want to ask for all of you guys to stay in case anyone has any questions uh, for you guys. Uh, so I'd like to, for us to give a round of thanks to our panelists. Again, Alex, Ken, Oiwan, and Tom. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, we'll see you online. <laughs>